importance. And uh, we'll have, uh, uh, we have enjoyed this so far and uh, we know that uh, there's much more to come. So let me share my screen and we'll get started. Preparation of the elements for the great fire. I'm sorry, brother. Let me share that one more time. Find my cursor. The chapter we have been considering in the fourth volume is the preparation of the elements for the great fire. The pastor speaks of how the nations are assembled, quote, in common interest and activity, no longer isolated as in previous centuries. And we see how international travel, communication, language barriers being overcome, and commerce have bound the nations of the world together today and made all quite dependent upon each other. No longer are any nations isolated and totally self-sufficient. Yes, this is by design that the nations can be assembled and the elements prepared for the great fire the great time of trouble. Zephaniah 3, eight, Wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured by the fire of my jealousy. Pastor Russell then concluded that even though the nations are assembled in common interest and activity, they are not united in brotherly love, for selfishness marks every step of this progress. We are reminded of how selfishness is the main element that has gathered the nations and has them headed straight for a universal outcry of the people for justice. And the people see the only path they have for any relief is revolution. This would all be very troubling, except we know that God is the great commander who now gathers the nations and assembles the kingdoms with the purpose of transferring earth's dominion to him whose right it is in Christ's kingdom. One of the elements that the pastor mentions as provoking the people to revolution and anarchy is what he interpreted from Luke 17, 26. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Genesis chapter 6 tells us that previous to the end of the first dispensation, 
a superhuman influence had entered into the world and power from an angelic source had produced very undesirable conditions to the extent of bringing into existence an unauthorized race who were powerful, self-serving giants. The pastor's supposition was that in the last days, there would be a counterpart of the giants, as there was in the days of Noah, even if not specifically mentioned by Luke. And the pastor rightly pointed to certain giant companies in his day as a possible corresponding element to the giants of Noah's day. Those giant monopolies, or trusts, tightly controlled the costs for goods and services and crowded out competition in a most forceful way. They imposed on the people no real options or choices for the goods people needed. Like the Nephilim, these modern giants were simply big overbearing bullies, which defied attempts by trade unions and regulatory agencies to moderate their unfair trade practices and employee treatment. This kind of behavior suggests an evil spirit influence on the hearts and minds of those men in power. Ephesians 6.12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The pastor also points out how the individuals who formed these tyrannical monopolies first received enlightenment and advantage because of being in a civilized society based on Christian principles and wisdom. So how deplorable it is that they would misuse that advantage in such a selfish way. But the behavior fits the picture of the Nephilim in Noah's time, a hybrid product of the far superior angels mixing with humans, corresponding to today's hybrid giants being begotten by Christian enlightenment, acting in combination with the selfish hearts of fallen men. Examples of the big trusts in the late 1800s were the steel and rail industries ruled by Rockefeller and Carnegie and banking systems owned by J.P. Morgan. These modern giants in the pastor's day were a real menace and threat to the nation, similar to the literal giants that threatened the world with violence in Noah's day. As the Nephilim could not be controlled by mere humans in Noah's day, we are assured that it again will take divine intervention to fully remove these powerful and cunning modern corporate giants. A specific example. In 1892, there was in America the Homestead Steel Strike. Now I'm citing this example as the kind of provocation that will bring about an uncontainable uprising in the future by the Lord's Great Army. Located just across the river from the Carnegie Pittsburgh steel plant was the scene of a brutal battle between the Iron and Steel Workers Union and Carnegie's Pittsburgh Steel, which wanted to break the union's power and punish union members. Pittsburgh Steel announced pay cuts refused to negotiate with the union, locked workers out of the plant, and then sent in private police to bully the union strikers. The whole thing became a bloody gunfight. Along with the use of the Pennsylvania State Militia, the workers' union was crushed. 
This all showed how hard it was to overcome a giant, a strong company that prospered under the lack of government regulations or meaningful enforcement. Another example of the influence of corporate giants was the Great Steel Strike of 1919. During World War I, industrial companies, labor unions, and the U.S. government joined together to form the War Labor Board, an organization that brokered a deal to stave off strikes in exchange for improved labor conditions. A consortium of unions that included the American Federation of Labor and the Iron Steel and Tin Workers Union called for a strike of the workers at U.S. Steel. The nation's biggest employer and one that refused to recognize unions 350,000 workers walked off the job in six states. While the strike temporarily paralyzed steel production, it eventually was crushed. Police and company hired thugs beat up the picketers. Again, the workers and unions suffered a great defeat and a big setback for the labor movement. So you can see why the brethren in the pastor's day expected that since the giants of the world that was before the flood were swept away in the flood waters, likewise, these corporate giants would soon be swept away in the coming equivalent to the flood, the symbolic fire of anarchy. Yes, monopolies and trusts were prevalent in the pastor's day, but we also want to note that by the early 1900s, laws and other restrictive measures to prevent monopolies were coming about. Antitrust laws and the formation of more labor unions. So even though it had been previously assumed that a great revolution leading to global anarchy was imminent by 1914, by of that original time frame. Let me explain. As far back as 1890, the Sherman Antitrust Act made monopolies and trusts illegal. In the early 1900s, President Theodore Roosevelt empowered several federal regulatory commissions to tear down the big monopolistic trusts. And President Woodrow Wilson, in a 1912 campaign speech, actually referenced the phrase, quote, there were giants in those days, and America was created to break every kind of monopoly and to set men free upon a footing of equality, upon a footing of opportunity to match their brains and their energies, end of quote. In 1914, the Clayton Antitrust Act expanded the Sherman Act by prohibiting price discrimination. New consumer welfare standards were then adopted in the 1970s. And as late as 2021, an executive order by the President of the United States established the White House Competition Council to combat monopolistic activities and cultivate greater competition in the marketplace. In fact, in 2021, six antitrust bills were passed which were designed to closely examine whether big tech company mergers would stifle competition. And Congress admits that in their assessment, not all mergers are bad for the public. And some large corporations have demonstrated that they are socially responsible. So, 
Because of these changes, applying the term giants doesn't exactly apply to large businesses today on the same scale as in the pastor's day. Yes, some large corporations today may attempt to take selfish advantage of the public by trying to control the marketplace, but the government and trade unions of this time period have demonstrated that regulations and trade unions are partially effective in limiting the unfair behavior of the large companies. So government regulations and trade union negotiations today still seem to satisfy the cries for justice, thus averting an uprising of the Lord's great army. It is interesting that Brother Russell, in the year 1916, when speculating about Elijah's mantle and the smiting of the Jordan River, was still waiting for the point when he could conclusively identify the antitype of that series of events. He could certainly see a great degree of the gathering of the nations and the preparation of the elements along with the outrage of the people, but what was the antitype of the actual smiting of the waters? Were all the pieces of this impending event fully in place so that some incident and maybe truth message would compel the people into an unstoppable anarchistic uprising? Well, I'm not saying that we should change the idea of big business being the giants, but Today, these giants are not as easily identified as the monopolies and trusts of the past. Outwardly, big business seems to have been restrained by regulations. However, let us point out that many big companies are still not voluntarily and benevolently cooperating for the public good they still have tremendous power and selfish influence in politics, government, and social media. For example, in 2021, Congress set laws in place to force the CEOs of Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google to be more transparent in business practices. This all sounds somewhat positive, but in actuality, the government regulators admit getting bogged down in technicalities, definitions of terms, and resistance to cooperate on the part of those giant companies. In other words, the giants in industry have not really gone away, but are now learning how to work around the regulations. Let's review a real example of how big business today can stifle competition and get around some of the anti-monopoly regulations. In 2009, Amazon launched a price war against a competitor called diapers.com, something over which Amazon was willing to lose $200 million on their own diaper sales in a single month with the ultimate goal to force the smaller competitor to sell out to Amazon. So Amazon might say, what's wrong with that? We are just being competitive. Here we see the dispute between the corporate versus the regulatory agency perspective. The original intention of the law was to keep companies from using unfair business practices. But from the selfish position of the giants, it is simply fair competition. It's important to emphasize again that government regulations and trade union negotiations seem, for now, 
to somewhat satisfy the cries for justice. But this will only delay the still impending anarchy of the discontented and restless masses, the Lord's great army. In addition to big business, another kind of giant has arisen today in the financial sector. Bankers, stock market speculators, hedge fund operators, and so forth. This new kind of giant, unlike the giants of the earlier years, produce nothing, contribute nothing to society as a whole. They don't make steel. They don't construct buildings. They don't weave cloth. They don't run grocery stores. They just manipulate the financial systems. Lending money, borrowing money, investing in profitable businesses, not to the benefit of the general public, but simply to benefit themselves, or more accurately stated, their rich owners. For instance, when the national economy and job situation was poor, as during the COVID epidemic, the government of the U.S., as well as other countries, tried to ease the pain to the general public and stimulate jobs by pumping hundreds of billions of dollars into the financial sector. The government essentially loaned the banks money at a nearly 0% rate with the theory that the banks would in turn offer low interest loans to the public for low interest home mortgages and low interest loans to small businesses to stimulate the economy. But the theory failed for the most part. Instead of the money trickling down to the small business sector and to the people, the financial institutions instead decided that they would make more money quicker by just investing that government money. Government bonds the Fed was buying. They knew that with the government setting new low interest rates, the market rate of government bonds would go up. It was a sure thing, a sure way to profit. Former Federal Reserve official Andrew Huzar stated it this way. The Fed's idea was the banks would be taking that money and lending it to the public effectively at lower interest rates. What the banks were doing instead was that they were just investing in the same inflated bonds that the Fed was buying. One government official said that the Federal Reserve money was to be the blood supply for the body of our economy. But instead of the banking system being that lifeline, they were simply the bloodsuckers. The conclusion is that this new giant is also born of selfishness. And even though in somewhat of a new form, it cannot seem to change from the same basic fallen behavior of the other kinds of giants. Andrew Huzar concluded, just because the Fed wanted to do something and wanted to help the average American, it doesn't necessarily mean that Wall Street and the banking system has the same interests. But now, we also want to suggest an additional modern-day analogy to the giants, another correspondency that may share the definition of giants. As we alluded to earlier, the Nephilim were a hybrid of two natures, spiritual and earthly. Mystic Babylon is a hybrid of the nominal church, the nominal spiritual heavens mixed with the world and earthly governments. 
take a look at Revelation 18.9 with the pastor's comments from Volume 3, Thy Kingdom Come, in the 1916 forward, page 4. And the kings, the political element of earth society, who have committed fornication illegitimately associated with her, shall bewail her and lament for her when they see the smoke evidence of her burning, Babylon's destruction. This indicates that the kings will become corrupt by their association with the elements of that harlot, creating that unlawful hybrid of nominal Christianity and state. And like the monopolistic trusts, imposing on the people no choice for the spiritual goods they require, no freedom of religion, no choice but the brand of beliefs that are sanctioned by a newly elected Christian government. Could this really happen? Well, the desire among many Christian groups is certainly there. In 2022, during a political rally for the office of governor, in the city of Atlanta, proponents of what is called Christian nationalism chanted, We the church are God's governing body on the earth, and we have been given legal power from heaven and now exercise our authority. How would this happen? If the Western nations become fearful of collapse under a future anarchistic uprising, a, a real violent outcry of the people for justice, then the Western nations will seek some means to quell the uprising. And they will most likely look to the so-called Christian political element that will claim they can help stabilize the social element because they claim they have considerable influence over the people. So in this scenario, the government would avert a revolt and get stability, and in turn, the conservative Christian element would be given considerable control in the government. Then that controlling party would enact laws to favor their particular Christian views, citing national security as their justification to prohibit the promotion of any ideas that they would deem as a threat to the stability of the nation. Well, even though this scenario is in the speculation category, and, and it may seem quite impossible to some, we do see that the hybrid of nominal Christianity and state already has a template in Russia that can quickly be transferred to Europe or the United States in times of emergency. In Russia, in 2002 and again in 2016, laws targeted religious groups outside of the Russian Orthodox Church and were justified as anti-terrorism measures. President Vladimir Putin was quoted as saying, the Russian Orthodox Church is part of a bulwark of Russian nationalism, and anything that undermines that concept is a real threat, whether that is evangelical Protestant missionaries or anything else. Since 2016, several Jehovah's Witnesses groups were shut down and non-Orthodox religious websites have been blocked. All those who defy these new laws are faced with large fines and six to 10 years in prison. Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists, and so forth have been labeled as extremist a threat to public order and public security. Evangelization in any manner is prohibited, including email. The new laws make it illegal to preach 
proselytize or hand out religious materials outside of specially designated places, or even to have religious gatherings in people's homes, terming these as gatherings of extremists. The final conclusion of this old order on the earth will be in the same manner as it was with the world that was of Noah's day. That world overflowed with literal water to destroy the evil influence on the earth. A deluge of another sort is about to overwhelm the tyrannical, political, social, financial, and religious institutions of this present time. The shackles of ignorance will be broken and dispelled by the increasing water of truth from our returned Lord. Sufficient light to compel even reasoning minds today to take even violent action to throw off all injustice. Eventually, under the administration of our Lord and the Church, the light from our returned Lord will fill the hearts of all those who desire and appreciate truth and justice. Habakkuk 2.14, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is the amen to our lesson the refuge of lies and evil finally being swept away by the waters of truth. We have spoken about what will happen as the old order on this earth goes down, but we have not spoken yet as to our role in all of this. We should be cautious that all of these chaotic events do not cause fear which would prompt us to be caught up in the world's struggle. This would be a serious distraction from our real mission as consecrated saints. Remember that Noah, even withstanding ridicule, kept preaching and kept building that ark. Noah had faith in God's words, even though there had never been rain before that time. The analogy for us now is that even though some predicted events may sound unreasonable to many, we should put our trust in the prophetic illustrations in the Bible and the pastor's predictions rather than in the disinformation swirling around from nominal Christianity. A good guideline to follow is to rule out any prophetic suggestions coming from the nominal churches and internet evangelists. What has been suggested to their minds is most often from the great deceiver. From James 1.12 in the English Standard Version, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised. Brethren, may the Lord bless us all in the months and years ahead that we be not deceived. We'll turn the meeting over to you, Brother Wright. Thank you very much for that, uh, Brother Bill. Very interesting uh, talk and one that uh, sometimes we're a bit blinded to uh, some of the ones that uh, are controlling us and uh, we in Australia have the same problem where there's a lot of power in the hands of only a few people and they can uh, control. So thank you very much for your uh, discourse there and you chose the closing hymn 156 from darkness to light Long in bondage, we have waited for the dawning of the light. Thank you, Brother Miro.
thank you uh, for that hymn. Uh, Brother Bill, would you mind closing the session with prayer? Thank you. Our Heavenly Father, we gather at this time to praise thy name, to educate ourselves on more and more on your character likeness, and uh, that we may be more enlightened, and, and, and in this we may be more driven, more fervent, more excited to proclaim your message to others and to find all the grains of wheat to try to bind up the brokenhearted, trying to give comfort to those that mourn and give them hope. We do watch the events of this day, knowing that the culmination, the conclusion of all is coming very, very, very soon. And so we pray that our hearts may not be fearful, but we may rejoice and think of the joy of how all mankind will be free from selfishness soon and may learn your character and your benevolence, your loving uh, plans for all, that they may learn this very soon. Giving thanks now and asking your blessing for the continued convention through Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Brother Bill, I've got a question for you. Oh, no. You spoke about the giants. I think you might have missed one. And that's the pharmaceutical giants. That, well, that's uh, kind of included. Yeah. I wasn't separating them out as separate, but in the corporate realm, thinking of all the corporations, they're the tech ones. I just used the tech ones as an example but obviously other giants. But as with tech companies, they're not all. The, the giants, as Pastor Russell was defining them, were showing how they are very selfish and bad. Uh, and we want to recognize that sometimes today they're hard to identify because there are some good pharmaceutical companies. There are some benevolent ones. There are some benevolent tech companies. There are some benevolent uh, uh, people in uh, that produce steel. They're not all bad, but even the ones that try to be good, it's very interesting. I'm thinking of Google in this particular case even though Google tries to be good and their corporate uh, people at the very top are proclaiming this, there are people in management underneath the corporate tops that all they want to do is show that they can sell more product. And so there are people underneath, even if the corporation heads want to be good, that use the selfish means and try to crush competition. And uh, so <laughs> it's, it's, it's not just at the top, it's all the way through all these companies. And that's the way it is with government. Uh, uh, when we're in foreign countries, Brother Raju is pointing this out, uh, whether it be in America or India, their selfishness that is controlling everything. Now, I was mainly using the United States and Europe as examples because in all of the elements that we've, and each person that has a, a discourse today and tomorrow is on specific elements, some on the social, some on the, uh, you know, just different parts and pieces of what is bringing everything together. And that includes the whole world, except for one segment, and that's the religious elements. That really is confined to Christendom, or what was called Christendom, Europe, 
we, we got to throw Australia in there too, even though it's not part of Europe but in, in the United States, because that's the focus of uh, where enlightenment has to come there too, uh, uh, for people to see that. That's, that's one of the final elements that people have to uh, be disillusioned with. I think that's true, and we have big disillusionments at the moment with some of the big religions over here. The, they're Christian, supposedly, in name, but their behavior isn't, and they're becoming very uh, disillusioned, and there's a tax on them. They're looking at maybe remo removing their tax benefits, but Brother John has been very patient with his hand up. I'd better hand over to him. Okay. Brother John. Yeah, good morning, Brother Bill. Um, what I was wondering about, you know, Brother Russell, you know, he speaks of the four different elements, the civil, social, ecclesiastical, and um, financial. And I think you focused quite a bit on the financial and some on the religious. I'm wondering with the civil and social, do you see um, giants in those arenas? I think there's been so much change since Brother Russell's day. Just for example, the governments are huge now. There's huge bureaucracies. They're involved in just about every aspect of life, especially in uh, the Western nations, Europe, and, and in America. And I just wonder if you've considered that or with the social element. Here in America, we have such influence from Hollywood, uh, the media, um, just... I'm wondering about those things over. Well, the reason I'm not emphasizing government as much, even though government can be big and powerful, government theoretically is by the people. Theoretically. Now, corporations are not by the people. Religion is not it, those the pope is not elected by the people uh so there are things that and, and notice on religion i said they become they can become a giant when they marry themselves with worldly practices so i'm not well, wasn't labeling say religion as a giant as it was maybe in the past, but looking at a, a time segment where they become more involved in politics and then they can start to bully and become a giant. And I'm kind of putting government in that same category because government, even though there has been corruption and maybe things that people don't like, there have been a lot of good things if we didn't have government, we'd be in a real mess. Uh, it, it, we have to have some amount of government, otherwise it's just chaos. So what I'm looking at is government becomes the unbearable bully type of uh, giant when they get like the, the kings of Europe were, at one time when they were married with the uh, Christian governments, where now they had each side had sanctions, you know, were, were sanctioned to do what they wanted to do. And that's where I see once Christian nationalism gets involved more in government, that that's where they can become the like like Russia is now the the real bully. But I'm not looking at government as being a bully because you have 50% of, let's say, the United States saying, well, that's a good law they put in, and you have 50% saying, well, no, that's a bad law. Uh, so that's still the voice of, of the people, and you can take any issue uh, that you want in politics and and see that it's not just being pushed by an autocracy 
uh, uh, an authoritarian government. It's representing what the people want. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> Uh, brethren, you're welcome to uh, raise your hand if you uh, wish I... to ask uh, any more questions. And uh, Brother John, were you satisfied? Um, I, I'll pick up a discussion with Brother Bill later. I, I do see government probably further along. I don't think the 50% um, on either side, um, you know, we have in the fourth volume the issue of um, the cries of the reapers and how in the political system legislation was passed that most didn't understand even what that uh, impact was going to be. And a government today is pretty corrupt. And um, I think whichever side it is, they're both trying to control uh, mankind. And I, I do see government today as a giant very entwined with the financial system, uh, with the businesses. Um, there's quite a lot of influence they're expressing through them. And it, again, I think it, it's whichever side you look at, they're trying to control because um, I think they're extremely fearful of what they see happening in the earth. The only solution they see is to control the masses. Um, so I have a little different thought, but I'll leave it there over. Brother John, I was going to, one of the things that strikes me as you were speaking is that you use the term they, they, the government, they. And I'm curious as to, it makes it sound like the government is a separate entity that is not responsive, that this is not a democracy, for instance, and um, that that there is a a grouping of people who, now, if you were to say that they is the political persuasion of the corporations pressing the government, then I would say yes, because there is pro political pressure, persuasion, coercement, maybe even bribery that comes from the economic sector from the bullies there to control government, but not all officials in government are going to fall to that kind of persuasion. It, it rides up and down. If you go back to the 1914 up through 1920s, there was more influence in government than ever before and more than there is, is now from the corporations. Yeah, Brother Bill, just um, some of the evidence and things I look at, there are those who will make an argument that America is, is not a free democracy that we take think of because there is quite a bit of control in um, the government sector. And I've worked in government and I appreciate your point about um, there are many, I, I would so much say there's many good companies. I think there's many good people who want to do the right things in whatever system that they're in. To me, it's the system of things that's really the problem, and I, I would include the government in that. Um, there's a writer for the Wall Street Journal named Peggy Noonan who has observed, and this is, goodness, 25 years ago, um, she was a speech writer in the Reagan administration. And she's familiar with, you know, military leaders, economic leaders, political leaders, all of these different things. She has a Catholic perspective. Just, I think it's important to always look at whoever's bias and so forth, whatever that that is. But she wrote 25 years ago about all of the people that some would call the elites that these individuals that you would look to to solve society's problems, that they had given up, that the problems were intractable, and that their issue at that point was to get as much uh, benefit for themselves and their families for as long as they could have it. 
And Brother Russell makes a point, I believe it's in the forward of the fourth volume, about how the governments would have half measures that, you know, the people will cry out for relief, but the measures are just partial. They never really solve the issue, and the cry just gets larger and larger for benefits to, to come. So uh, when I speak of they, as you asked, I'm really talking about the system of things. I know individuals make up those systems, and there are good and bad. Um, all around, political parties, uh, whatever. Um, it's it's very hard, I think, today because our society is so polarized. But I would just say my focus is on the systems. Over. Uh, Brother Cup, you've uh, got a question for uh, <laughs> Brother Bill. Go ahead. Just don't forget to speak uh, slow, brethren, for the translation. Uh, mulțumesc. Mulțumesc deosebit, frate Bill. Uh, M-am bucurat deosebit. Uh, Specially. I will close the video for better sound. Brother Russell says that the revolution or the great time of trouble that we are waiting for in the forward, uh, the fourth volume, I guess, it will be immediately after the first uh, world war, he said. That was, that happened. After one year, the, there was the revolution from Russia. Uh, half of uh, Europe was uh, taken in it, but its effects was all over the world. All, uh, all governments made changes, new conditions, even better, like those in socialist countries. In the first volume, and day, uh, day of Jehovah, page 335, there is a scenario how will happen, how may happen this uh, time of trouble. Um, page 337, we see that is possible. That this great time of trouble to take place, and after the society will reorganize on a better basis for the people. Nevertheless, this will not be the perfect ones, this will not be kingdoms uh, basis. If you can see, maybe for reflections, those pages and what Brother Russell wrote there, and the fourth volume, page 556, also in English and Romanian is the same, the same pages. Brother Russell mentioned that the anarchy that will, uh, add, uh, in the time of Gog and Magog, will go to against Israel. World governments will have some rem remnants. They will not be strong like before, the, but they will exist, and only then when um, Israel will win and Gog will be destroyed, all governments of the earth will be destroyed. My question is, can you see this, that the revolution, social uh, Russian revolution fulfilled the brother Russell's uh, point of view about the uh, great time of trouble described in the volume. 
it was for 70 years, like in Isaiah, we have the prophecy. And after this, by Gorbachev, it, it ended. And the prophecy shows that the queen of the earth together, of course, with her lover, the governs, will uh, raise up again. And again, will have the glory they had before. Authority. But this moment, second one, will be very short. It seems like it will finish by uh, invasion, Gog's invasion. And probably the triumph will be short and then the Lord will prevail. So like you said, the, today's giants are kept, um, they are not losing, they don't do what they want because of the fear of new general revolution. The govern, knowing this, they try to stop a little bit, the general anarchy revolution, like the one in Russia. It's a thought in uh, Brother Russell's, uh, on, uh, based on Brother Russell wrote, maybe not to now you will answer, Maybe not now you will answer, but uh, what do you think? If now, enough now, later. <laughs> well, anyway, certainly. I liked very much. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Ariel. Um, Thank you. It's a, you've covered a lot of territory there. And I think uh, that when we piece together the whole convention, because everybody is talking about a very specific section mine was on the giants. I'm not talking about all the pieces and parts, but certainly there was an expectation and Brother Russell's expectation about socialism was correct, that that was something that the world he saw would want to try next, that, that they would think that would be a solution, but it would fail. But like all the other parts and pieces that we've been speaking about that bring the nations close together and will make it easy for the Lord to take it all down at the same time, it's a gradual process of building, building, building up. And there are some times that get very bad, and then there's some times that get better. And it's like the woman having spasms of childbirth, that there are corrections, there are times when there have been revolutions in the past, and then it gets better for a while, and then there's another revolution, and then it gets better, and then there's another revolution. And we, we see that there are still some pieces of the puzzle that have to fit together yet before the final breaking out of the full anarchy. We have seen small bits, we have seen, but mostly what we see is revolution. Sometimes we call it anarchy. We, we saw uh, uh, many years ago, what we call the Egyptian spring, which was, a, some called it anarchy in Egypt. Well, it really wasn't, it was revolution. We, we see re revolution on the streets. We saw it in France this last week. It's still there. Is that anarchy? Well, some people, some of them are doing things that are very bad, burning cars, lighting fires, uh, pillaging into uh, stores, but it still is not to the stage of all-out anarchy,
because when that happens, it's not just the liberal or the socialism element. It's going to be combined with the conservative element who also learned that they were deceived. Hmm. Right now, the social element, those that, per, that are pushing the idea of socialism more, are the ones that generally are revolting, that are generally pushing change. But this conservative nationalistic element is also got, to, they have to learn their lesson. They have to learn that they were deceived. So by the churches, by their government, by their corporations, and these can even be the people that were making money. These can be the ones that are the head of the church. These can be the followers in the Catholic Church. Remember, who throws Jezebel out the window? Was it Jehu? No, it was the eunuchs from within the church. Now, that hasn't happened yet, and they are still deceived. They cannot see this yet. So there's a lot of education through the light of truth that has to go forth yet to educate. So by the time Armageddon is in full swing, by the time Armageddon is finished, the people will have learned that no system on earth can be governed correctly because the, it's all selfishness. Uh, Just a small little... Uh, like, uh, uh, like the last time. Um, <laughs> the last crush. Do you see it? When Gog from Magog will go against Israel, so or you see it sooner, the last crushing crush. Reference. Da. Am văzut că a fost a fost o parte la început was a part of beginning and last at with Gog and Magog. How do you see this? Thank you so much. Well, that seems to be with Israel in a more final lesson that has to be learned. And it, it seems that uh, uh, that may not have, uh, it, 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 I don't see that happening first. Now, this does not mean that there won't be a war in some way involving Israel first, but uh, because some will speculate on that, that may happen. But the final Gog and Magog, I think is, it'll be after we're, uh, after the church is gone for sure. Uh, thank you, brother. Maybe it's uh, time for one of the other brethren to ask their uh, questions of uh, <clears throat> Brother Bill. Okay, but uh, but Thorin, I think it is. Go ahead. Don't forget to. Ace fraților. Salut, dear brethren, brother Florim from Romania. About the Gog from Mogo after the church is completed, I heard many discussion who is Gog and Magog, and how. How far 
Do you have an idea how far will we are from this point? 